Well, good evening, everyone, on this warm summer evening. My name is Richard Waring, and I have been hosting this poetry series uh, for as long as I can remember. <laughs> it's been a good stretch, and uh, I'm very excited to be um, introducing our featured poet. But first, I want to um, read a few little tidbits to get us started. When he was 32, Beethoven mourned that he could not hear a flute or a shepherd singing, which he wrote, brought me almost to despair. A little more and I would have committed suicide. Only art kept me back. It seemed unthinkable to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I feel lies within me. I think that might be a good book title, which I'm keeping for myself. <laughs> what lies within me. Oh. Charles Wright said, without language, there is no poetry. Without poetry, there's just talk. Talk is cheap and proves nothing. Poetry is dear and difficult to come by, but it pulls us across the river and put puts music in our ears. Gregory Orr writes, I think when I read a poem that deeply moves me, that feels beautiful and moving, I feel as though I've been given more courage to live. Mm -hmm. And lastly, Adrian Rich writes that poetry asks of us a grace in what we bear. Well, tonight, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Alexis Ivey, who is a 2018 recipient of the Mass Cultural Council Fellowship in Poetry, awarded for her crown of sonnets, The A Street Shelter. Her latest book, Taking the Homeless Census, was published by Saturnalia Books in 2020. Her first poetry collection, Romance with Small Time Crooks, was published in 2013 by Blaise Vox. She is co-editor of Essential Voices, a co-ed 19, the COVID-19 anthology, West Virginia University Press, 2023. Her poems have been displayed in City Hall and featured by mass poetry aboard the Red Line subway. Her work has appeared in J Journal, Borderlands, Worcester Review, Lake Effect, Exit 7, Saranac Review, and many other magazines and anthologies. A recent resident of the Vermont Studio Center, Alexis lives in her hometown of Boston, working as an advocate for the homeless and teaching in the Poem Works community. Please welcome Alexis. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation, Richard. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone who came. Um, I'm going to actually begin reading two poems that I love by Linda Lemenza because she can't be with us tonight. Um, so I'm going to just start from her poetry collection, Left-Handed Poetry. So these first two are hers. On Rainbows. To see one, you must turn your back to the sun. There must be rain in another part of the sky, each drop lit by the sun's white menu, and a secondary luminosity trapped inside the rain, twice reflected, reversing order, violet, indigo, blue-green, yellow-orange, red, an ordinary rainbow, memorized in primary school. To miss it, your back must be flat on the hospital bed, curtains drawn, outside world notwithstanding. Hmm. The next poem is called Honda Pilot. Truth is, the purple swollen disaster of my foot where her tire wrecked me in the mobile parking lot, 
my right elbow, a shattered bone I can no longer lean on. Now, I'm part of her, SUV, my DNA forever embedded in her bumper. Mm. Mm. I love those two poems, and I love the way she talks about colors. It's beautiful. Um, so tonight, I am not reading anything from any book that's published and out in the world. I am reading poems from a manuscript I've been sending out the past year that hasn't been taken, and it's called That Ribbon of Highway. And I'm going to be reading some formal poems and just some good old poems and a few songs that I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first poem is called Disposable Camera in a Travel Bag. I hope the pictures aren't of Spain. Why did I take so many shots of Moorish tile at the Alhambra when I could have bought a postcard instead? Or maybe they're photos from the Kiss concert, the black and white faces and long tongues of the fans, me wearing my one black shirt, fire on the stage, Alyssa woo-hooing until she lost her voice. For sure, these are the shots my mother made me take of Lauren's wedding shower, the one with the embarrassing lingerie. Or are they just the smoke from my hookah, smoke that my ex said looks so sexy leaving my mouth? I have a feeling he is on them, us on Halloween, a couple of scarecrows, hay in our flannel pockets. No, they're probably just those pictures of the moon I took before I knew the moon wouldn't come out well. Hmm. Booth number 91, Wellfleet Flea Market. There's the flannel shirted man selling ivory next to the hot dog stand. Is it real? Too white to be real. This box full of small, uncrafted pieces. If they're real, I'll buy them. I ask if it's old ivory, the kind of ivory the Romans used for the whites of an eye and their statues, or the ivory the Irish decorated the hilt of their swords with. If it's the ivory Vietnamese used as a seal for their documents, the ivory billiard balls and piano keys were made of, pre-illegal trade, pre-ban, I have ivory rules. An animal must be dead or the tusks must be so removed from the head, so gone from the jaw that it could never look like it had been attached to a breathing being. It has to be at least 220 years old, not straight from a hunter, but four owners past the hunter. Choose the whale or elephant that is least endangered. These are the negotiations I make with myself. A thing so far displaced from the nature of itself yet unpolished, untumbled, not too far from the truth. <laughs> this next poem's in a form called A Sestina. It's a 16th century Italian form. Sestina after quitting smoking. I miss the lighting as much as I miss the smoking. It's the idea of being a smoker I miss most. I had my last cigarette Sunday, used a match, enjoyed that last strike. It's been 20 years of this persona. Is this the last of this persona? After a meal alongside my coffee, I smoked three cigarettes in 20 minutes sometimes. They broke up time. I miss all the paraphernalia. I'll get into candles, enjoy my good luck charms and clean ashtrays. Cigarettes calmed me, though scientists tested cigarettes and they don't do squat for stress or persona. Sometimes it's my only enjoyment. They're magic, those smokes. My pick of poisons. I was Miss Badass Cowgirl Harley Lucky in a pack of 20. Marlboro Reds got me. 20 bucks a carton in Tennessee. The part of cigarettes I won't miss is having to ask where and when to be that persona and the sadness of my clients when I can't bum them a smoke. I won't have to say no as much. How enjoyable. The enjoyment I had smoking 20 times a day, now I just crave a smoke. 
two cigarettes when I'm talking or three cigarettes when I'm thinking about the past, when persona was my whole self. I miss checking my purse to make sure I have my missing habit, try to enjoy my life being emptier, more room for to find my sunglass case, my 20s, my lip balm, or a new persona, me smelling of roses, not tobacco, me without cigarettes, me not smoking. Now it's been 20 days since I had a cigarette. I'll always be missing this persona. Enjoy the new me, the smoker who quit. Birds I have known. Grackles were the sound in my childhood sky. In every bedtime story, I was a crow, a trickster, the bad omen. Here, sparrows bathe in street-side puddles, seagulls solely loving the sea. Geese mate on the islands of the reservoir. And as Santos makes our bed this morning, the phoenix tattooed on his arm rises. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rand McNally's Atlas of the Continental USA. <laughs> it's not about distance, just the best way to get to the next view, once in a lifetime. I mean, I'm from Boston. When I touch the named after British towns, I feel quaint. Gloucester, Plymouth. On a map, I can touch the places unreachable to me. Mountains, every starred capital. Isn't every view once in a lifetime? I avoid straight lines, always take the road that goes alongside a river, move through I-80 past Kansas, press my pointer finger on a western landscape without a dot. I want there. Hmm. Truck Stop Casino. I pick up a souvenir. A machine pressed flattened penny, a penny worth more than a penny. I line up the penny with the image, crank the crank, the pressure tough for half a turn, always Lincoln's a goner, and his memorialized grave crushed too. Cost two quarters for the engraved image of Bonnie and Clyde's wounded stolen 1934 Ford Deluxe. I got another two pennies at Death Valley, penny of the place I climbed to, Yubahibi Crater, that gouged out eye with two hikers on the lid, and the bison, the one I didn't see. <laughs> so this next poem is lyrics. Like I said, I am not singing tonight. <laughs> Additional <laughs> verses to This Land is Your Land. My Honda broke down on the I-80, smoke a hundred cigarettes waiting for the bus to take me out of Wyoming. Being white, no policeman bothered me. Hitchhiked through Utah, headed for Denver, a dozen desert hours spent with that trucker. We spoke of Standing Rock and the bourgeoisie. In this story, I got home safely. See a man in bushes by a northern freeway, his way to shelter, health care, three meals a day. In this wishful America, no one gets deported. All are supported, sung about, and free. I'm working with folks hurting for their rights and dignity. And the sole truth, my privilege lets me choose which America is meant for me. Mm. Mm. This next poem is also lyrics. Um, moving away from folk and into the blues. Keep <laughs> playing the blues, blues. At age 15, I wore long skirts. At age 15, I wore long skirts, had no ass, no thighs. Men were drawn to the florals of my legs, not my eyes. At 35, I have a man who loves me for my everything. And though we go all over this world, we're still not exchanging rings. 
I won't lay my aces down while he says love hanging up the phone. I won't say love, only after our lines a long drawn dial tone. A fourth floor walk up is our home. So much of nowhere to go. So much of nowhere to go. Not sure this is love anymore. Lately, his eyes aren't on my skin tight jeans, my ass, my thighs. Busy worried his love is in the heart of some other woman's eyes. Hmm. And this last poem I'm going to read is in the form of a pant tune. So a lot of repetition you'll be about to hear. How my heart gets said. I stop for the view on the horizon. It's true or partly true. Every place is a vista I keep going to. It's true or partly true. I can't tell how far I've gone and I keep going too. No one's on this path. I can't tell how far I've gone through these cedars, maples. No one's on this path. No openings, no cut throughs through these cedars, maples. Sometimes the only way is the only way. No openings, no cut throughs. I can never go back the way I came. Sometimes the only way is the only way. I stop for the view. The horizon I can never go back to. The way I came, every place is a vista. Thank you so much. Wow, that was great. You Third remind me was. of uh, one of my mentors, uh, Allen Ginsberg. You you seem to have an old soul going back to the 50s. <laughs> especially with the addition of the uh the blues yeah and other lyrics very good very good thank you so much thank you coming up next month uh as i mentioned earlier uh triple feature uh, Lori kagan francis donovan and linda lamenza and now Turning to our double open mic, uh, let me introduce Carla Schwartz. Wow. Okay. That was so wonderful, Alexis, and I'm so happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. So I'm going to read you two poems. This one, uh, first one, is definitely lighthearted. <clears throat> based on an expression that my father used to say all the time. It's called the ass from the elbow. My father used to describe my teachers at school as not knowing their ass from their elbow. <laughs> the elbow with its dried gray cracks that dissolve into cream as you bend the joint. The ass with its one big crack but look closer, a rose-colored sunburst flutters from within. You don't need hands to bend an elbow, bend and flex, bend and flex, like the flashing red signals warning an oncoming train. What can you bend your whole, while, while you can bend your whole body, also without hands, falling like unharnessed pea stalks that bend over themselves when they grow too tall, a yogi's sun salute. Sure enough, the crack spreads open. My teachers must have been very stupid if they didn't know their ass from elbow. Not using your elbows does little good in service of ass cracking when you most need it as on the toilet, where a good cheek spreading goes a long way. <laughs> okay, that's my trying to keep some humor in tonight. Yeah. And now, now this other poem is a little more serious. It's called Extra Bones. When the orthopedist insisted on a surgery of his own invention, 
when he threatened crippled them by the age of 25, unless I'd have both feet in casts for all of third grade. My mother sought a second opinion from a kind-hearted doctor who skimmed his fingers over the os navicularis just above my instep and prescribed art supports and exercises, my ups and downs, my ins and outs to stem the pain. I felt every hike, sorry, to stem the pain, I felt every hike my mother coaxed me on, the needles of ache, which at eight I couldn't staunch until, as time went on, I grew and outgrew the hurt above my arches, but by then I thought I was too old to hike with my mother, who loved the steps, the stones, the views, until she grew too old, then died. Today on my mountain hike, in my years much beyond those 25, I noticed the distant color-strewn hills, crystal towers of frost built up on the moss, the fungal orange moons under a root. On the steep descent, with halting steps, I take care not to slip, but when an icy patch takes me down, I sit with the stone wearing my mother's hiking pants and laugh, my mother's laugh, at how it smarts. Mm. And that's it. And thank you so much. Quite the body of work, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Carla. Up next, we have Lori Kagan. Hey, Mom. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the first one uh, called This Poem Isn't Clever. The first letters of each line combine to spell nothing in particular. It doesn't rhyme. There are no universal truths or pleasing alliteration. If you read it from the bottom to the top, it doesn't make sense. This poem doesn't describe a great love, the beauty of a bird in flight, or the vastness of the night sky. It doesn't end with redemption. It suffers from melancholy. It's the victim of writer's block. This poem is feeling stupid. This poem is seething. This poem is awkward survival and hiding and resisting forgiveness. Yes, wow. Okay. Um, the next one is, uh, in my fantasy, I'm this punk band. It's called the Shrieking Bunnies. I play weddings, funerals, Thanksgiving. It's so much easier than being my sort of person, always caring what people are thinking. When I'm the Shrieking Bunnies, I don't even have to sing. I just scream and scream and scream curse my parents and everyone who didn't protect me from them, curse God, and just to show how angry I am, praise Satan too. When I'm the shrieking bunnies, I'm covered in satanic tattoos, and I spit on the people that yell, just play a song for Christ's sake, tell them to fuck off. I roll around in the shards of the beer bottles they purled at me, go home bleeding, but not entirely unhappy. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And thanks, Alexis. Great. And now, Steve Nickman. Thanks, Richard. Alexis, poems, your poems are really, really lovely. Um, thank you. I've been writing some poems about working with kids with my day job for a lot of years. <laughs> Am, am I am I muted? No. Oh, You're good. oh okay. I had a, a little sign telling me to unmute. Um, I have two of them. And the first one is the turtle puppet on my hand. I say, turtle, this is Kate. I know her. 
So say hello. I think she'd be nice. So Turtle cautiously moves toward you, but pulls his head inside his shell, tells me, I'm scared. I don't know her. I tell him, Turtle, he won't make a friend if you keep hiding. She won't bite. Then you giggle. You say, come on, Turtle, I won't bite. And Turtle, reassured, comes closer. You pat his head. Hmm. <laughs> and the next one, it's it's highly disguised. It's called Sam Talks About Adoption. <laughs> I must have had a name when I lived in Colombia, or my parents couldn't have taken me out of the country. I was bar mitzvah when I was 13, played saxophone in high school, Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. After graduation, my parents took me back to see Columbia. I had a massive panic attack before takeoff. A village in the mountains. I saw a sheep butchered, became a vegetarian. My birth mom wasn't there. She'd only been 16. I met the family that took care of me till I was a month old. I've never known what I was supposed to do. I've traveled to Europe, even Japan. I had a dream, a Land Rover, a small plane crashed near an airport. I couldn't see her face, not sure it was my mom. Mm. Mm. Very touching. Mm. Thank you, Steve. Please welcome Wendy Drexler. Hello. Alexis, I just love your, your poems and your self-talk and rules. I make up about ivory for myself. And it's just so, yes. Like the <laughs> rules I make up about what kind of eggs I'm going to eat. I mean, you have these just remarkable insights. All right, two poems. Gossip and metaphysics. I load the dishwasher thinking about how the body belongs to nature, how after your parents have died, you are scorched by the stars or what's left after the scattering, noticing as well that we are out of finished jet dry rinse aid. What we want, Akhmatova says, is gossip and metaphysics. After my stepfather's funeral, we went to see my big fat Greek wedding, laughed our heads off. The jolt of being alive, the belly splitting gift and lift of it. Then giddy in the mall after the movie, balancing like a kid, walking along the top of the raised wall, protecting the plantings, asking my cousins what's happened to so-and-so since high school, who else has died lately. It only seems to come to you, the gratitude at times like that. Like that after the lightning strike, the cancer, the car wreck. Sometimes I can see through the words on the page to the way the body can hold them. Other times the words stay flat. Wake up, I tell them, to help me get past what is cold and thin walled within me. Getting closer to hurrah, the way the drive-in movie once made the world seem important, outsized. The best part was watching the sky tint pink and purple and roll on its carpet of stars and the way the actors got so huge in the dark, and how we sat on beach chairs, the tinny speakers blaring like a chorus of frogs a quarter croak apart. All of us are wrapped in peaceful people for the next two hours. Haven't you lived it too, the plague, the losses, your wrecked and ancient childhood, each day's frantic encampments and assessments, telling yourself that in the grocery store, it's okay you left your list at home as you wonder whether loss increases love. Was it ricotta or mozzarella you needed and the finish you remembered just now? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
In 2017, my husband was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. Clover Food Lab. This place is as spotless as a chemistry lab, not one dirty dish in sight, not one crumb as the barista pours a scoop of ice into my plastic cup, which rests beneath a silver metal frame that holds a paper-lined gold filter. He's trickling hot water meticulously over the grounds of my decaf pour over iced coffee. Four or five passes, but it's the slowness I crave, the waiting for this coffee. And I bet the black, gray, and white speckled counter is made of an environmentally friendly, non-toxic composite. Mm -hmm. I've had a hell of a day. And while I wait, I marvel at the tidy displays, bags of roasted beans, the El Salvadorian Monte Carlos, the Costa Rican Terrazzo, each color-coded, printed label curated like an exhibit at MoMA. It's the order I crave, away from the books piled so high they sway beside my bed, the stacks of New York Times, the checkbooks I've hidden from my husband and don't know how to tell him, the three times today he's asked what day today is. It's the sinuous shape of the four beakers lined up on the counter I want with the ripe pulp of puree juice waiting to be mixed with sparkling water. Actually, I want everything here. I want the stainless steel stove, the covered cauldrons of chickpea fritters, the unblemished white tile, the minimalist blonde good looks of the designer chairs, as if we have all day to be at our best. I want the pesto breakfast bowl with organic long wind farm, lowercase tomatoes, white clutter up lunch with capital letters, a soft boiled egg and massaged kale. I want a massaged back and a massaged mind. For dessert, I'll want the egg free, peanut free, soy free, milk free, wheat free, pistachio halva. I'm going to walk out of here scot free and easy as a newborn babe who's played all day in Clover. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Tremendous. Thank you, Wendy. Up next, please welcome Mid, Mid Walsh. Hi. I have, um, I love to work outdoors during the summer. And <clears throat> I have two poems about the different hammers that I use. One, one each. <clears throat> the first one is called Rubber Mallet. So much depends upon the head at the top of the handle, black mass flexing on impact, so the struck stone intact recoils and shivers, settles better into wet cement. Having the hand of a mason, I love the waking smack a rubber mallet makes, the clap on the back from a friend who sees my point. And the second poem is called Hand Sledge. The hand sledge is a heavy, very heavy hammer. Grasp a hand sledge at the handle end and try to hold it level. Desire in the head of the hammer twists your arm and swings the steel slug down, divoting dirt or a knee. But hold a hand sledge overhead and lean your torso forward, lightening vaults from your fingertips with a boom or zap in the cartoon frame of your workspace and God powers to send your arm. Once gripped in the passion of its fall, the head will hit whatever it will. I have split in the ecstasy of striking a stake I meant to drive cracked a hammer handle against the stone I meant to hit. People close to me have felt their heart burst into splinters. Wonderful. Thank you. And now um, I would like to introduce, um, let's see, there's so many of you, Vivian Eyre. Um, hi, Alexis. It's so great to see you and to hear you read your poems and, and to learn that we have yet one more thing in common, which is smoking. 
<laughs> big, hu big hug to you. Um, today is World Ocean Day. So if you have an ocean nearby, please um, feel free to praise, praise the ocean. Mm. Um, this poem is set in the winter, you know, after today's, I don't know, what was it, 80 degrees? So here we go. Floods. Again, the causeway floods. Rings of rising tides mark the raised road stanchions, the way you measure a child's height on a wall. Behind the line of cars, my car. Water deepening around the legs of the slickered patrolman, guiding our turnarounds. I turn up the heater, turn on talk radio. A panel debates climate change. Brr, so much for global warming, one man snickers. The water's engines roll out sheet after sheet. Sun glances off the surface. So like that Delacroix painting where light glances off a bed sheet, where a man shows off his naked mistress to her husband by holding a sheet in front of her face. The husband shows no eyelash of recognition. He doesn't see what he's lost. The way we don't see how the rain increases its sumptuous weeping. Now I hear voices, the woman in the painting and this flooded causeway saying, take a long look. I'm not going to be here forever. Mm. And this poem, Our Lady of the Sea's Nursing Home. Never mind that Ida owns a bait shop or her crew neck sweat is lettered, surfs up, mocking the prongs of her canula tube. Now she's waving me into the stern of this room. I'm tem temporarily beached here, she says. Temporarily meaning a cozy blanket hiding the truth. Meaning, when can I go home? Meaning, if only I could shamble along the shore without sandbags tied to my breath, mm. entranced by osprey, winging through swollen air, meaning how to bear this bearable hunger. I hand her the white bakery bag, the sugar donuts we both love. Mia cara amica. Ida's powdery fingers point to the tidal app her productive loneliness, where she tracks the rainfall's gush, the wind's gut shove, the crowns of tides, even as the tides of her body rise. Mm. Thank, you. Mm. Thank you, Vivian. Moving on, please everyone do read your second poem. Uh, we have plenty of time, we've shared the time, so Please delight us with a double. Please welcome Kathy Whittam. Okay. Um, I have unmuted, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. What a heartful reading. Um, and thank you so much, Alexis. Wonderful to hear you again. So I'm going to read one poem about my dad and one um about my mom excellent this one is a recently published in an online journal called synchronicity and an issue about family sitting at the foot of my bed my dad taught me atoms how everything is made of atoms my blanket air and people too a for alpha b for beta and scary gamma that go right through you. Then he told me a story about the girls in factories who painted watches with glow in the dark numbers, mm -hmm. their young full lips pointing tiny brushes so as not to waste the radium. Lying in bed, I imagined their skeletons glowing in a cave. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. My dad engineered electrons to precision at Los Alamos. The sound is what followed him. Decades later, as his grandchildren listened, entranced by his eyewitness account of the first atomic bomb test blast, his hands slowly mushroomed the unholy roar shuddering from his core. Mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. Kind of nicely timed with Oppenheimer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Replacing my mother's love seat. Yep, the very one that's right over there. <laughs> A flowered fabric disintegrating. Nostalgia disintegrating. Sometimes emotion spins to the practical. Future flirts for attention. A hummingbird unlocks the currency of breath between the living and the dead, and a new marigold love seat pedals a path. Mm. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, guys. Very nice. And now, Diane Silvestri. You follow this. This is just amazing. What a feast. I don't have enough to say about all of you. Mm. Everybody's getting better. <laughs> I mean, reading and writing. So here we go. Um, this poem, I'm pleased to say, after some disappointments, this one was recently accepted to the Examined Life Journal of the Carver College of Medicine out in Iowa. Mm. And um, so I'm brave enough to read it. <clears throat> Next patient. I shake the patient's hand. She smiles, gestures toward her helper dog lying beside the wheelchair, offers a thick, quavering lisp. The theme of thank you. I pause. Her voice warbles again. Ha theme a dick bar. I restate her syllables in my head implore my comprehension to match the effort she gives to greet me. She reads my eyes, slowly, loudly. He say must think bearer. I cannot dismiss her. Embarrassed, I pray to divine what her palsy marionetted tongue begs to say. I am near despair. My God, it's been a ragged month. Wait, I got it. I smile at her eyes and acknowledge his name is Shakespeare. That's a wonderful name. Mm. The next one um, is a little longer ago in an earlier chapter. I envision free flying bliss. Soaring panorama, a skydive in grad school. Book a test ride along with three others in an empty crop duster. Absent a door, propellers buzz, strain us aloft. I crouch behind the pilot's perch. Floor rivets rattle, gusts swat and swallow the voice of what to fasten, when to launch, how to leap clear, how to pull what, when, and what if, and below the gape, black roofs crawl, blind trees grope, stone walls sag toothless, fencing the feel assigned for plummeting. I swallow dry and later burn the registration form. Who was I back then? Hmm. Mm. Nice. <laughs> wow. And now, please welcome Carrie Lofman. It's 
surprise me there, Richard. Um, first, I have to say, Alexis, um, when I first met you at Barbara's table, you were the only person writing sonnets. And I was so impressed because I thought, wow, that is so hard. Um, so over the years, I actually have tried any number of forms and um, I find them to be great fun. So I'm gonna read this poem, which uh, will, which just got accepted, well, was named an honorable mention in uh, Passager's poetry contest this year. It is an American sonnet, which means 14 lines, maybe, maybe pentameter, but no rhyme. Two blocks from the Arboretum. Our mother never taught us how to love. Not being loved enough, weaned on paucity. Do you remember losing me on Custer Street? I was three, you eleven, and loath to care for me who lagged behind. You turned a corner and were gone. My tears did not bring you back. I ran panicked the blocks to our house where you waited, pale and unrelenting, anti-Madonna of the splintered stair. Mm. By high school, you'd spun yourself so far away, I knew you only by your absence. Bereft, I ran solo under Don Redwood, embracing a perfect and necessary dark I seed. Sister, you are still lost to me. Mm. And you really want a second poem? Yeah. Okay. The beauty of birches is that they go their own way. Blithely pin a chipmunk as lunch for a heron. Mansplay like drunks on the subway. Sometimes separate and fold into oak leaves. Feel their trunks thicken. Bronze brindled limbs relinquishing the vertical of redwood in symmetry of pine for an earthier milieu. These birches are not as athletic as those of that famous poet. No bowing down like compliant snow maidens, no aspirations lofting a bedeviled boy off toward heaven. Rather, they shudder to rest and don't look for praise, devolve into good neighbors, hosting demi-plates of fungi, stringently spaced. December limbs the scumbled skins of the fallen, and I know Robert Frost was right. Earth's the right place for love. Mm. Catching fire in sidelong glances, bearing weight enough to anchor our love's tendered branches. Mm. Gorgeous. Wow. Thank you, Carrie. Connemano Wadsworth. Okay. I am feeling as though I've had a long drink with all of these poems. So mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to read an old one and a new one. Well, new-ish one. Garage on Raymond Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Our parents lived like students, mattresses on door, mattresses on floors and cinder blocks for beds and couch, bookcases made with boards and bricks, great grandfather's mahogany desktop balances on sawhorses for a dining table, floors of painted concrete cool in every season, a corner of drafting tables with T-squares, rolls of paper, pencils of different leads sharpened to thin points on bits of sandpaper, erasers, pens, protractors, rulers that translate one measure to another, balls of wrinkled tracing paper in overflowing waste baskets, sometimes a stark white model of a building carved to scale 
or a friend's easel and paints, a near finished terms and ass assignment drying. Our parents fill part of the hallway, hallway's wall with a blackboard where my brother and I draw pictures, houses, rivers that spill down to the sea of gray floor, past a bedroom to the living room, our canvas. Mm. And that was a, published by Main Street Rag. Um, and this was, I think, just, yes, just accepted. Dance, dance. We sit close. His double espresso cools. My brown gold brandy splash slipping through me. Couples dance to brass drums, singing Caribbean soul, letting each other go all smiles and glow, spinning away, then holding close in the music's grace. And I am all want and wish until a woman comes to me, says, I want to be like you, you too, when we are your age. I tell her my years, and she says, no, I want to be like you too. I smile, say, just keep dancing, and you will. Yes, boogieing together no more. He on his crutches, me in my soft shoes. As we leave, I am dancing as my good man smiles. Mm. Beautiful. Wow. And now Jonathan Abel. Oh, wow. It's uh, hard to follow stuff like that. That was brilliant, uh, Connemara. But the whole open mic's been tremendous. And of course, Alexis is generally yeah. beyond. Yes, fabulous. So aside from being World Ocean Day, it's also um, gun awareness. And uh, so I pulled out something, it's, it's a pretty rough draft, but uh, called Thoughts and Prayers. Scratching at my paper, the walls, leaking ink, blue black over much, spilled over many gunshots, over Columbine, over Sandy Hook. We learn nothing, allowed children to die, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. People wait outside of Uvalde. Locked doors do no good. Safety, resource officers don't save the day. AR-15s, hollow points, macerate fre flesh, hollow, toothless laws. Mm. And something a little less uh, political, I guess. Um, this was recently published in Pacific Review. The apple in the garden of my body. <laughs> Only dark, stinking came out of my body. I wanted something, wanted something virtuous, something pretty to grow. But boys became daddies and girls have babies that grew in their bellies. Every fall, I'd eat the season down to the core and, waste not, gulp the tickly and slippery seeds. They said an apple tree would take root in my tummy, <laughs> climb my chest with the pink-touched pink flowers my mother loved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Wonderful. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hey. Should I go ahead? Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I think the, the audio went out for a second. So this poem is written um in the voice of a child. <clears throat> Out of state wedding. I can't believe my uncle's got a plane, a horse, 
a Winnebago. He lives near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. But I lie. That's a, that town's a two-hour drive from Silver City. I'm having a screaming fit about riding in his exploding pinto, stuck in the middle with no air. Dad says I'm going to get a whooping. I can tell he says it to impress his brother. I'll sleep in the Winnebago. My uncle says this is where they hide the hooch from grandma and grandpa who total tea. I'm up high toward the back on a thin blue mattress. I pee the bed. I don't lie about it. I consider it. Or did mom find me waking in that pool? My oldest sister, Beth, steps on a nail in the paddock where my uncle's one horse lives. She was wearing sandals. Her kissing cousin carries her over the railing. What's tetanus, I ask. My other cousin is getting married to a rancher's daughter. We take the Pinto to the farm for a visit. I pet a cow, observe a pig. The rancher says something my parents don't like. It starts with a wet and ends with a back. They really want to leave, but the wedding will be at the ranch, dad presiding. My cousin is 18 and so is his wife. Isn't Melissa a really blonde name with her floppy white hat? Dad's longish hair is slicked back, his red beard extra pointy. My cousin wears a white carnation on the giant lapel of his blue tuxedo with the black piping. My mom looks 18. My oldest sister looks sexy. My middle sister and I are in matching skirts we sewed from a simplicity pattern. She got the better fabric, safari themed with yellow lions. Mine has rows of red tulips on a blue background. Simplicity. I hear someone say that everyone changes religion in America. My cousin and his wife will later become Mormons. I don't know why. I just know my uncle gave up religion when dad got fired from a church for teaching the choir to sing from their sphincters. Hypocrites, my uncle sings. <laughs> All right, and this one, um, this is for Linda, actually, because um, it takes place on one of her favorite beaches. And also um, it's in memory of my dog and she was really kind to me when my dog died about a year ago. So mm -hmm. how to make friends in Massachusetts for Josephine. I am careful on the beach. The bathhouse is infested with fox. Rabies bait, says animal control. My hound flirts for a cookie catches the stranger's smile instead. We depart for the rocks which necklace the beach. Three women sun themselves on the equinox. Last night, the moon was full of glare for me. How do sirens make friends? Use a dog as a ruse. All three glisten with eyes closed in worship. They could roll to the waves. I walk slow until the one with the bansley tan squints, sees the dog's limp. Cape Cod's not always friendly, and neither am I. Pretty girl, poor pa, has she soaked in the sea? My instinct to leave. How could I linger with muses? My dog plants herself between them, tongue lolling herself at home. Josephine smiles. So easy. All four face me and the sea, and I stand alone. I pretend we should go, say something like, lunch, play this coy game, pluck a quill from the sand, hum just enough, feign, I don't care. Mm. Wow, thank you so much. Have I, I have a feeling I've missed someone. Well, hi, Richard. 
David, yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let me find you. I I'm right here. So. I thought so. <laughs> yes, yes, you're, you're in the room somewhere. Okay, here you are. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, now I see me. Um, well, actually, it's great to ha have heard all of this, um, all of this wonderful work before reading. And, and Alexis, I want to say, I, I really hope that your manuscript finds a good home soon. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the two poems I have um, are quite different in nature from each other. So um, the first one, this is composed entirely a language extracted from one chapter of Joseph Heller's Catch-22, and particularly the chapter titled Major, 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 um, whose idea of a good joke. From the start, he had been exactly too late. Heavy shoes, filled out without comment, vanquished near a cracked window. He forged his false mustache, dark glasses, Safeguard against his father, a man with rugged, creeping thrift who turned alfalfa out of him. He worked without growing. Long winter evenings did not mend him. No one else hesitated to give a nasty amen. Every opportunity was the first of a long series of practical jokes. The fact that he had been born. The bad-tempered land, always some total stranger. He was dreamy, tentative. They told him to look before his father killed his ass. What's the matter with people? The only thing they could do with him was trotting back and forth. An IBM machine broke him, barefoot in icy mud. It was still raining on clothes and socks. They were inclined to dispute his outfit while his hips turned white. The mud shuddered violently until some shoes wanted to push him along. Damn, no winners? Losers roared up in his Jeep and made ammunition. End of the game, rain gazing at him. A basket burning. He floundered to his feet in rigid attention at a nosegay of posies. Petrified, he seemed too good to eat. All he was supposed to do was falling to the ground whatever he was. Mm. And the second, um, as I mentioned, quite different and pretty new to this second one. Somewhere to lie down. If it was a cot raised two feet or three on its metal frame, or if it was a mattress slapped flat on the floor, I slept on something that summer removed to an enclosed porch. If without curtains, or if privacy was implied by some thin fabrics, dawn light fell into my eyes, solo. The summer, I threw myself out of my marriage, threw myself across town, thought life renewed in shock and scant bedroom with walls, half windows for two months or three. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, David. I will close things out with a couple of poems inspired by my recent pilgrimage on the Camino from Santiago, Spain to Finisterre and Muxley. And it involved a certain amount of silence. This is called Approaches to Silence. The, giver, the river gives way to rock and fallen branch until nothing is left but silence. Inside my brother was a sorrow, heroic against the tide of ill health, then silence. As a child in the tub, my mother washed my hair, nothing but a song between us. After the bath, my father pulled a comb through my tangled curls to make me less wild. As she lay dying, my mother entwined my hands in hers 
no words needed. I walk in thick woods, lost and found, struck dumb among a symphony of birds. Camino Haiku. I've been arrested by beauty in the middle of a path of stones. Utterly alone, my inner life looks less known than the moon's craters. I am the tortoise to everyone else's hair on the pilgrim's way. Once I word fasted and dined only on silence. It was so tasty. Deep in revelry, a lone cricket lets me know I'm not alone. On the Camino, flowers are the daily bread for my pilgrim eyes. I like up better than going back down, but flat best of all. Along the path, haiku moments abounded until they didn't. <laughs> Out of my head, words form on the field of my silent page. Mm. Well, that was something. Lovely. A feast, a feast of words. Yes. On this warm evening. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And and tell Linda that we look forward to hearing her. Yes. And her health. Until we meet again. And so good to see all the people Thanks, haven't seen everyone. for so long. <laughs> well, uh, take courage and uh, stay strong, everyone. Good. Thank you for everything. Lovely yeah. to see all of you again. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Take Thank care. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.